stuff on there that's going to incriminate me. He's president, he what? Because he's president, he shouldn't Well, information. what information would he not want out in the tapes that he's going to claim is the reason he can't give us? Or things that would damage national security. So he, he claims executive privilege. He refuses to turn the tapes over, stating that these, there are information on those tapes that would damage the national security of this country, which is probably true, right? Yeah. There's conversations on there that would, <coughs> I'm sure, damage national security. So what did the courts ask him to do? What? What well, kind of? <laughs> yeah, he's going to edit them all. <laughs> but anyway... They ask him to turn over the tapes that don't have anything that would damage national security. So the courts ruled that the president had to release those portions of the tapes that did not relate to national security. Well, there was a guy that was kind of a jerk about this. The Watergate committee had a special prosecutor. His name was Archibald Cox. And he said, I'm not accepting partial tapes. I want the whole damn thing. Because he knew what Nixon would do. What would Nixon do? He'd delete the parts or not turn over the parts he didn't want him to see. And he'd say, well, I can't let you hear that because it's going to damage national security. So Archibald Cox, who was the special Watergate prosecutor, he stood up and said, I'm not taking those partial tapes. Well, because of that, on Saturday, an underlined Saturday, on Saturday, October 20th, 1973, on Saturday, October 20th, 1973, Saturday, October 20th, 1973, President Nixon orders Attorney General Elliot Richardson to fire Cox. Fire that SOB. Our orders him to fire him. Now think about this. Who's, who's in the middle of this thing too? The Justice Department. The Senate Watergate hearings are going on, but does the Justice Department have to be involved? Well, the President tells his Attorney General, you're going to fire Archibald Cox. Fire. Fire him. <coughs> Elliot refuses and resigns himself. He refuses and resigns himself. The Nixon. The president said, fire Archibald Cox. Richardson said, I'm not doing it, and resigned. Well, who's next in line in the Justice Department? The Solicitor General is what he's called. The Solicitor General. So President Nixon goes down to the next guy in line, the Solicitor General by name of Robert Bork, and he tells him to fire Cox. So after Richardson resigns, Solicitor General Robert Bork now becomes acting leader, so to speak, of the Justice Department, and Nixon goes down the line and tells him to fire Cox. And he fired him. And this firing became known in Watergate history as the, underlying Saturday, the Saturday Night Massacre. Because you had the firing of the Watergate special prosecutor and the resignation of the Attorney General. And this firing became known in Watergate history as the Saturday Night Massacre. Well, this is where it gets kind of interesting. So, the pressure continues. The pressure continues on the tapes. And finally, the White House releases some of the tapes, but not all of the tapes. They released some, but not all. Well, the part that they didn't release had been erased 18 and a half minutes worth. And on November 21st of 1973 is when it was discovered that important parts of those tapes had been erased. 18 and a half minutes worth. So on November 21st, 1973, after the White House released some but not all of the tapes, it was discovered by the Watergate Committee that important parts of those tapes had been erased. About 18 and a half minutes total had been erased off the tapes. 
and this missing information was no doubt conversations between President Nixon and his closest aides. So pretty important information to see if he knew about Watergate. What was the date on the tape? Okay, at November 21st, 1973, it was discovered that important parts of those tapes had been erased, about 18 and a half minutes in all, and this missing 18 and a half minutes were conversations between Nixon and his closest aides. Because you could tell by listening to the tapes what was erased, okay? Well, how is the Senate Watergate Committee going to get them to release all of the tapes? They want them all now. Who are they going to have to appeal to? The Supreme Court. And so the Senate Watergate Committee appeals to the Supreme Court and asks them for the release of all White House tapes, national security or no. They appeal to the Supreme Court. So it will be the Supreme Court of the United States that will decide whether the President needs to turn over all those tapes, security or not. Well, in the meantime, while they were trying to decide whether the Supreme Court was trying to decide whether they're going to make him release all the tapes, Nixon, the paranoid guy that he is, in April of 1974, he releases transcripts of the tapes in the form of books so all the American people can read them. He's trying to get himself out of a jam. So he releases transcripts of the tapes for people to read. And this is while the Supreme Court was trying to decide whether they were going to force him to do that. And that was in April of 74 where he decided, well I'll tell you what I'll do to get the people on my side. I'll release transcripts of the tapes in the form of books and people can read them. Well what do you think he did with those transcripts? You think he edited them a little bit? Yeah, he edited them to the point where people began to even question him more. And every time he didn't want something, you know those blank spots at 18 and a half minutes? In other words, what he did is he took the stuff that he originally gave to the Watergate Senate Committee with the 18 and a half minutes out and he printed those, okay? And every time a blank came up in that 18 and a half minutes off and on, you would read in the transcript and it would be saying, well, Emily and I decided that we would expletive deleted, expletive deleted, and then Emily said that we would go have lunch and then after that expletive deleted, expletive deleted. And what he did is all of that 18 and a half minutes that he did not disclose that had been erased on those original tapes that he gave the White House, in those transcripts, he just put in the place of the blanks, expletive deleted. Well, these books sold like hotcakes. I mean, incredible. They were the nation's best seller. Everybody <laughs> thought they were awesome. But what did it do to Nixon? It just showed the American people that he was hiding something, because every time of that 18 and a half minutes that was missing, and I should have reiterated, that wasn't like 18 and a half minutes straight. It was, you know, five seconds here and 20 seconds here, but it was 18 and a half minutes total. It just made the American people more suspicious. Finally, in August of 1974, the Supreme Court made their ruling and ordered the President to release all of the tapes no matter if they had national security concerns or not. Okay, August of 74, the Supreme Court ordered Nixon to release all of the tapes. This was the end for Nixon, when he had to turn these over. Matter of fact, to give an example, these release tapes included a conversation between Nixon and H.R. Haldeman less than a week after the break-in, talking about the break-in. Okay, so when Nixon had to release all of these tapes, he was done. Okay, and one example was in these tapes that he released, it included a conversation between himself and H.R. Haldeman less than a week after the break in talking about the break in. So, did he know about Watergate? Hell, he knew about it at least a week afterwards, probably sooner. <coughs> well, these tapes that were ordered to be released by the Supreme Court go down in American history as the smoking gun tapes. Smoking gun tapes. What does that mean? <coughs> These tapes began known as the smoking gun tapes. What does that mean? Come on, put it in an analogy. What is smoking? Why do they call it the smoking gun tapes? He just shot himself, right? And the you know, smoke's coming out of the barrel of the gun. Smoking gun tapes. It incriminated him. And there was no doubt that these conversations between 
Nixon and his aides showed that he knew about the Watergate break-in from the very beginning. Okay? Now, let's think before we get to the resignation of a president. Wouldn't it have been just a lot easier if Nixon would have said, yeah, we screwed up? I mean, think about this. He won the election in one of the biggest landslide victories in American history. Okay? Let's talk about the resignation of a president, clear up a little historical fallacy here. Well, after all this came out, several prominent Republicans urged Nixon to do what? Resign. Okay? But he refused. He was a stubborn SOB. And he held firm to the presidency. So some of his even close friends, you ever heard of Bob Dole, Robert Dole, Senator Dole of Kansas? He was a tremendous friend of Richard Nixon. He even said to him, man, you've got to resign here. And Nixon said he wouldn't. Well, finally, a bunch of congressional leaders went to Nixon and said, I just want you to know that they're getting prepared to impeach you. Now, what's it mean if you're impeached? No, 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 that's why I want to get the, the fallacy out. What does impeachment mean? Who impeaches a, a president? The House or Senate? The Senate. And when you are impeached, you're accused of high crimes and misdemeanors. And then you go on trial, and who tries you? The Senate. The House impeaches you. The Senate tries you, and then they have a two-thirds majority at the end, and if you lose, you lose, and you're out. So what happened is a bunch of congressional leaders, people from the House, went to the President and said, you know what, just want you to know that the House is preparing impeachment proceedings for you. So faced with probable impeachment by the House and conviction by the Senate, instead of going through that, on August 8th of 1974, President Nixon resigned the presidency. So again, I want you to understand that. Faced with probable impeachment by the House and conviction by the Senate, rather than to go through that process, Nixon resigns the presidency on August 8, 1974. And he stated that he would resign effective noon the next day. So he announces, excuse me, on August 8, 1974, that he will resign, and he resigns at noon the next day. He will become the first president in American history to resign from office. So a lot of people think that Richard Nixon was impeached, was he? No, he resigned prior. Who are the only two presidents in American history to be impeached? Andrew Johnson, who followed Abraham Lincoln, and Bill Clinton. The only two to be impeached and face a trial. Both were found not guilty. Okay? Well, we'll finish this and I'll tell you a story about that. So on August 9th of 1974, Nixon gave his last speech as president, got on the helicopter at the White House, was flown to Andrews Air Force Base, aborted Air Force One, and flew back to California, where his home was. August 9, 1974, Nixon gave his last speech. They put him on Marine One, took him to Andrews Air Force Base, put him on Air Force One, and he and his wife, Pat Nixon, were transferred back to California. What happened the same day as his resignation? What had to happen? You have to have a new what? So Gerald Ford was sworn in as the nation's 38th <laughs> president of the United States and is the only man in American history to become President of the United States. Gerald Ford was sworn in as the nation's 38th President of the United States, Vice President Ford. And he became the only man in American history to become President of the United States that was never elected by the people. Never elected. Now, let's talk about some of this. Andrew Johnson that faced Lincoln, and he took over Lincoln assassinate. Was he elected by the people? He was elected vice president by the people and then moved up to the presidency. But see, Ford was an elected speaker of the House. You see what I'm saying? And he was elected to the House by the people of Michigan, so was he elected by all of the people? No. That's why he becomes the first and only president to assume the vice presidency, from the vice presidency to the presidency without being elected. Now, if you think, if you summarize Watergate in just a couple of sentences, what, is it, what did Nixon's second term begin with? His second term begin with? Think about it. What does second term begin with? An ass kicking of major proportions, right? In the election. It began with bright hopes. 
Okay, less than two years later, he's disgraced by the events of Watergate. And it's all unnecessary. Did, he, did they need to do these things to get him elected? God, not even close. Do you think that letting out mice and letting off stink bombs and breaking into the Democratic National Headquarters made a difference of, what was it, 523 electoral votes to 17? But that's how paranoid Richard Nixon was. My God, he was a paranoid man. Media hated him. He hated the media. And he told his people, do whatever it takes to get me reelected. He didn't even have to show up and he would have got reelected. That's a tragedy. And it put this country in a tough time. And it was from this point on that Americans really began to what? Distrust the presidency. Really. Before this, there wasn't a lot of distrust in the presidency. I mean, did people distrust John Kennedy? No. Did they distrust Lyndon Johnson? No. They didn't agree with his policies, but they trusted the guy. I mean, if the President of the United States said something, it was the gospel truth. Watergate and the resignation of Nixon caused this country, I think, for the first time to question the president or the presidency. Okay? Now, we'll finish today with a little story off the cuff, which kind of ties in. I think I've told you this, but I'm going to reiterate it. I know Hoyt knows it, and Jacob knows it, and Mauricio should know it also, because I think it was second semester when you came in. But back when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, Andrew Johnson assumed the presidency. And he was a Southerner during that time after the Civil War, so he never really fit in very well. And the radical Republicans in Congress wanted to get rid of him. So they passed something called the Tenure of Office Act, which stated that the president had to have the Senate's approval before he could remove anybody from his cabinet. Because they knew that Johnson hated Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War, and wanted to get rid of him. And Johnson was so mad about this Tenure of Office Act, which he thought was unconstitutional, that he fired Stanton to spite him. And what did they do afterwards? The House impeached him for high crimes and misdemeanors for violating the Tenure of Office Act. And then the Senate had a trial. And what happened, Schaefer? Yeah, you do, because you wrote about it in your scholarship application. Kind of? What happened? That's right. Jim Lane, a senator from Kansas, committed suicide just before the Senate trial. And he was replaced by Edmund G. Ross. And Edmund G. Ross hadn't been a senator for five minutes, so to speak. And they started voting on whether they were going to impeach Johnson. Now think about this. The North controlled Congress for the most part. The North was wanting to punish the South in the Civil War. And the North expected that all Republicans would vote against Johnson. Right? Impeach him. Get him out with the trial. So he voted, 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 voted. And to get the two-thirds majority he needed, a Republican senator from Kansas, Edmund G. Ross, had to vote guilty. If he votes guilty, Johnson's out. If he votes not guilty, Johnson stays in. He's a Republican. What do you think all these Republicans are expecting him to do without question? Vote guilty. He stands in front of Congress. He said, I'm looking into my own grave. And he votes his conscience and votes not guilty. And his political career was over. But was it a courageous act? It was so courageous that when John F. Kennedy wrote his book, Profiles in Courage, who's one of the eight courage, courageous Americans he wrote about? Edmund G. Ross. So anyway, you guys should think about getting a copy of that and reading it because it's a good story. All right, here's kind of our plan. Tomorrow, we're going to have some fun. I'm going to show you a video I think you'll like tomorrow for those that are here. We'll have a review Monday and a test Tuesday. And then we're going to start this mini-series, the 60s, and that's what we're going to finish with. And I think you'll love it. Now, this test is going to be worth 160 points. It's a big one. So when I go through this review with you, make sure you are studying and prepared. Everybody going to be here next Tuesday? Next Tuesday, yeah. Okay? Yeah. Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah, you have your AP exams, I think, on Wednesday. Do you not? Well, you got to get that review drill because that will be important because this test is 160 big ones, okay? All right, any questions on that? And then we'll get into that mini series.